name is Brad Grossman. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the founder of Zeitguide. And Zeitguide means spirit of the times in German, uh, or Zeitgeist, it's Guide to the Zeitgeist. And Zeitguide means, uh, Zeitgeist is spirit of the times in German. And uh, today uh, we are starting our summer semester. And uh, for those of you who know and have been with me for the last 11 weeks, I uh, have been doing this culture class for free. Um, and the point is to keep everybody on this learning journey as we're probably going through the most horrific moments of our lives, um, to stay inspired, to stay clear, um, and stay knowledgeable because uh, the world is in chaos. And if there's anything I could do uh, in my heart is to help everybody uh, stay sane and inspired during this time. Uh, I actually did this before uh, coronavirus actually started. And uh, I you know, did it for executives and companies and teams. And uh, in terms of understanding what I do, uh, like I said, I guide you through our constantly changing culture, but I look at the world in four big subjects or pillars of change. I just don't talk about consumer trends. Uh, I look at consumer trends in terms of like how we all are consumers. And if we work, we're consumers. And if we're using technology, we're consumers. And all of us in work and in terms of our personal lives have to contextualize what's happening in the wider world. And we're seeing that up front magnified with what we're experiencing now, uh, how our lives are being shifted by what's been happening in the last 12 weeks. And uh, when I teach my classes, I'm always asking people whether it's now or uh, before 12 weeks ago, I'm always asking you, what did you learn? Why is it relevant to you? What can and what should I do about these learnings? And how can I integrate these trends into my own business practices, strategies, decision making and life? And uh, it's all very confusing right now. And again, uh, I hope that I could provide clarity and inspiration. So, like I said, uh, we started our semester and it was all planned before uh, the last week uh, and the uh, experiences we've just had in the last week happened. Um, so I actually pivoted everything. I pivoted my business model. I've always had Shepard Ferry coming on uh, this culture class and I'm so excited and grateful that he's here. He's the artist and activist and we're gonna get to him towards the end of the class. But uh, I thought that with the recent events, I wanted to bring in the author to talk to us as well, um, Calvin Baker. So after I do my typical zeitgeiting, and again, for those of you who are joining for the first time, the way culture class works is I start with my zeitgeiting, kind of quickly go through, connect the dots amongst all four of those buckets. Then we're gonna meet Calvin, and uh, then we're gonna talk to Shepard. And if there's time at the end, we'll do some Q&A. So thank you all so much. We built this community for the last 11 weeks. And I think now there's almost a, a thousand of you who've been on these calls. And like I said, this is summer semester class week number one. Uh, so uh, I just want to say also that 25% of the proceeds are going to be going to the EJ, EJI, the Equal Justice Initiative. And uh, it was founded by Brian Stevenson, who is a uh, acclaimed uh, public interest lawyer. And uh, this has been around since 1989. And if you missed it, there was an amazing uh, New Yorker piece yesterday, uh, which was uh, his an interview on what his frustration has been behind the George Floyd protests. And if you look at the, my highlight, I always try to highlight the heartbeat of the article. He was asked, many of these protests had more white people than the protests five years ago. And so what do you think that is or is not likely to change in this movement? And basically he says, it's not, it's, it's not hard to protest. We need people to vote. We need people to engage in policy reform, political reform, and we need people to not tolerate the rhetoric of fear and anger that so many of our elected officials use to sustain the power. So that is really the only way, and according to him, who's a scholar, a lawyer, and the founder of what I believe, and I know Shepard, you and I talked about, is one of the best uh, organizations that we can uh, provide contributions to right now. There are many others, but that's the one that I had chosen.
So back to the four buckets, um, I'm going to start with what's happening globally. And so when I say what's happening globally, I obviously always talk with the lens of America because I'm an American and I'm smarter about what's happening in America. I wish that wasn't the case. It's just the culture that has shaped me throughout my entire life. But uh, part of my skill set is being curious. So uh, I know many of us have been looking at our feeds and on television and the media and talking to many of our employees and friends about what's really happening and what we should do. Um, and uh, it has, uh, this has been a way for comfort and support for many of us. Um, but it's interesting to see what's also happening in the rest of the world. So I just wanted to go to, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, when I, when I uh, start with global, uh, the big theme, I've been tracking the themes throughout the entire last 12 weeks. So what that means is that every week I had a theme. Week one was basically shock and awe. Then midpoint, we were like, oh my God, what's happening? And again, I'm talking about the coronavirus. And throughout the entire uh, uh, program, or what I've been saying in terms of uh, what I've been saying in the last 12 weeks, is that the coronavirus has been both a magnifier of all the horribleness that defined our world before, uh, let's say, we were quarantined in America here in uh, the week of March 12th. I think that was the exact day, or March 13th. I think it was March 12th. But it's also going to be an accelerator for all, hopefully, the change that we need to have. And I talked about racism in literally the first week. It wasn't in the context of what's happening now, and especially with black and brown people. But even before we were quarantined, uh, this Canadian organization with the Marie Curie Foundation did an ad in a campaign where they would give hand sanitizer to everybody uh, within uh, in this area of Canada. Um, and you could see people before, they weren't even wearing gloves, they're not social distancing, but this was in response to the prejudice against people of Asian descent. And before, just in terms of understanding the context of protests, uh, there have been protests all over the world. I actually defined, and I wrote a piece in November that the world was on fire, and global protests all around the world starting with Hong Kong and to all the continents uh, has been really alarming and, and sad and nobody really knew what to do. And so it's interesting that again, coronavirus and the way that we've been thinking collectively has been again, a magnifier of what's happening before and an accelerator of where it's gonna go next. And before this last week, you could see people all over the world fighting for inequality and injustice against their government. This is Turkey, this is Germany, this is uh, in, in Italy, in Rome, and uh, the list goes on. So uh, again, so now we are, you know, in a state of domestic protest coming from the point of view of the United States, but we are also seeing that our protests now are spreading to the rest of the world from Vancouver and, uh, and people are using this opportunity to criticize, uh, 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 you know, they have been criticized for human right violations, but they're even protesting and calling this as an American symbol of hypocrisy. But you can see the, pro the protests happening all over on racial tension. This is in London, the, the, the embassy. This is a Syrian artist who basically created a mural depicting uh, uh, Floyd. Uh, here is in Toronto. I'll move on quickly. Uh, here's a Japanese person who tweeted, I can't breathe. Uh, here is actually uh, uh, an Iran uh, official who basically is talking about, the, pro the again, the, pro the hypocrisy of how we've been saying in uh, Iran, and they're basically cutting out everything where they said Iran to Americans. So we're seeing the rest of the world. And even this, they're spread in May 31st that hundreds basically have protested against the Tokyo police because of violence against a Kurdish man. I'll just show this. 
Ya sabır lan ya. Ne bu işe ne şey? Ya 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 ne bu işe ne şey? So in Shibuya in Japan, and those of you who have been in Japan, uh, they basically protested in, uh, in response to this violence. So again, this cultural uh, experience we're having here is spreading everywhere else. So it's important to know that and see what the biggest picture is. And uh, Hong Kong, which was probably the first protest that was uh, highlight in the press before we've seen others in Iran and South America, Bolivia, which is in South uh, Bolivia, which is in Latin America, uh, France with the yellow vests, uh, were you know this conversation of Hong Kong uh, that has been wanting to protest against China uh, is coming to the forefront of conversation just today. The Prime Minister of the UK said that he's going to omit three million people from Hong Kong to the United Kingdom. So there we have, that's what's happening in the global zeitgeist right now. In technology, I just want to say that uh, in addition to many of us know the, the, how Twitter has responded to Trump's tweet about looting uh, and shooting, um, as opposed to Facebook, which is getting, you know, having like a negative spotlight on them. That's happening in the tech world. But look how crazy this is. I mean, just last week, we were all talking in fear for all of coronavirus. And if you saw some of the beautiful pictures of peaceful protests in, in the United States, you see that there's no social distancing at all. And you can see how the conversation in social media has literally plummeted. Uh, and on the coronavirus and George Floyd has, uh, has risen. Uh, the other thing that's really scary to me about technology right now is that uh, we've been talking in culture class a lot about China and uh, they, that they actually require their citizens to take photos of themselves when they get a, a mobile phone and send it to the government and they are highly, and if you've seen how they've been responding to the virus, uh, they've been using surveillance technology and people are saying, okay, if they're using it for this, what else could they use it for? Well, uh, our president is basically saying that, uh, that he wants to uh, designate uh, because he designated the Antifa as a terrorist organization uh, and he's asking authorities to using these, uh, these uh, surveillance uh, uh, technologies to actually help people, see, uh, to deploy tools of conducting surveillance. And what does that mean moving forward? There is actually a great piece though about technology companies, and this is a bigger issue uh, from uh, TP Insights, which talks about and links to all the statements that have been said by uh, um, all the CEOs of technology companies and legacy companies that have been uh, basically talking about what's happening in the world, in our country right now, in the rest of the world, which pushes me over to the consumer uh, part of the conversation. You know, should companies, and this is a lot of what we've been thinking about, and I know a lot of you had, uh, uh, was responding and uh, supporting uh, Blackout Tuesday, but, you know, there are brands that have been accused of hashtag issue washing. We've been thinking about that in terms of when COVID started and how should brands, you know, connect with their consumers without feeling like they're selling. And even though Nike uh, uh, had this commercial, and many of you I'm sure had seen it, especially the people here who are in uh, you know, brands and marketing, which many of you are, you, know, you have an activist who basically is going to be on our show, our show, uh, Culture Class next week, uh, Cindy Gallup, who basically talks about herself, defines herself as the Michael Bay of, of advertising. She likes to blow shit up and she really calls everybody on their shit of hypocrisy. Like Nike, for example, right? She's saying you don't have one black person on your executive leadership team. So as consumers and like we've been, and also working for companies who are using or thinking about this way or uh, this situation and thinking about how to communicate to the public uh, has been uh, an interesting conversation. I mean, most companies have been uh, in blackout uh, mode been talking about how 
they value the diverse voices and they support the black community. But this is TikTok. Look at here. Look how like weird this is. It's so tone deaf. It's like we stand with the black community, but because we generate powerful and important content with over 1 billion views. So like you see the subtext there of, of how uh, hip hypocritical that is too. So it's been really hard for agencies and brands and consumer facing industries and in our companies to really talk about the failure to act. Uh, I mean, uh, talk about what we should or how we should be responding to this. And there have been many pieces about how we should, you know, they were using the Blackout Tuesday uh, incorrectly because people had hashtag, if you didn't know this, um, of Black Lives Matters, where we should have used that distribution mechanism on Twitter and Instagram to allow them to uh, continue their protests. So uh, that makes me go to, you know, the workplace. And so thinking about us as consumer facing brands of what should we do, the big conversation, I'm so excited to talk to Calvin about this, is that, okay, are we just talking? Or what can we do? And what should we really do? And, you know, yesterday, many of us had, you know, uh, pay tribute to uh, Blackout Tuesday. Um, but, uh, you know, what do we think about in terms of work? And one of the things, again, the magnifier of what I was talking about pre-corona, right, the issues, I have been talking about in the last, I don't know, three years, a trend was what I was calling workplace er evolution, right? The workplace was evolving right, in the last decade. We have ping pong tables and barista. We were trying to figure out how we could have more diversity and inclusion, but like we're learning that we really haven't been doing enough. But the workplace er evolution, and that's the R, uh, we have seen such tech companies where there have been walkouts because of climate change, especially in, uh, in, at Amazon, there were work after Grenda Thunberg had her day, of talking about climate change. And, you know, Google, I think there were like 2,500 employees who walked out because there was an executive who was male who got accused for sexual harassment and got a $95 million parachute. So we've been seeing before that there has been like this workplace er evolution, right? That they were fighting against their employers because they weren't uh, responding to their shareholders, their uh, stakeholders. They were just responding to their shareholders. And that had been a change, uh, you know, in the, the developing uh, the zeitgeist to uh, the coronavirus that basically uh, impacted our world. And so here we are now where Facebook employees have staged virtual walkouts to protest the, the Trump posts and not taking them down or commenting on them like Twitter. Um, if you have been following the story, it's constantly evolving. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg was on Fox News. He talked to Trump. But again, the magnifier versus accelerator, even though Facebook had a positive uh, sentiment by consumers because they enabled us to all come together, there was a lot of tech lash about them before. And even Scott Galloway and Kara Swisher on Pivot a great podcast said that Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg, and I'm not saying I believe in this, that they should go to, to jail because they're just as bad as the big oil companies because look what they're allowing their platforms to do, whether you believe that or not. That has been a conversation. And at work in the workplace or evolution, this is coming to the forefront of the cultural conversation uh, and in the context of what's happening. So that's my zeit guiding four buckets. Obviously, there's so much more to talk about. I only had a few minutes, but this is a good time to shift to my friend, Calvin Baker. Uh, Calvin, are you there? Hey, Brad. Thank you for having me. Calvin, I think you're on mute. If you can unmute yourself. I don't believe so. Do you hear me? Hello? No, we don't hear you. No? No, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Hello, all. Yeah, when we don't hear you. I think everyone hears me except you, Brad. Well, that would make an interesting interview. Uh, do people hear? So everybody else could hear? I just can't hear? Yes. Oh, there you go. Okay. All right. Sorry, everybody. Pivot. 
Calvin, thank you for being here. Now, Calvin is somebody that I just invited to be with us um, uh, just because of what's been happening in the last week. And I thought he would help us clarify uh, in his point of view, uh, how he's thinking um, as somebody who has studied race and is about to come out with a book uh, called A More Perfect Reunion, which obviously is very timely, um, called uh, A More Perfect Reunion, Race Integration and the Future of America. And uh, what I, uh, you know, I, I wish we had so much more time. Shepard and I planned this for weeks for him to launch culture classes summer semester, but he and I both thought that it would great, be great to have you on. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of time. I'm hoping that we could figure something else out, Calvin, for you to come back, um, but uh, uh, because, you know, of the schedule and I wasn't planning on this, but now you're here and I'm grateful. Congratulations on your book. Uh, I think everybody needs to go to Amazon right now and put it on chat to pre-order it. And so, uh, Calvin, uh, thanks for being here. And Thank you, Brett. There's one thing I, I want to correct quickly, if I may. And I haven't so much studied race as I've studied multiculturalism and the idea of what it means to be a global species. And I've written that from the, uh, from the, from the vantage point of being an American, uh, as you have, and I've studied the country's history and I've written about it primarily narratively as a novelist, and I wanted to speak directly to this moment from a sense of frustration that race is in fact a red herring, it's a misnomer, it's a construct, but it's also the field that shapes us. And this question of how do we get out of that field? And the, the proposal here, my analysis is, we wanna shift it slightly from a conversation about race, like what is race, how am I affected about race, that, which goes very deep, to one about integration, which is the solution. And it is a solution people were aware of at the beginning of this country, right? going back to the revolution. Right, and so Calvin, did you, I mean, you, you've been working on this book for how many years? I mean, did you think that this would happen uh, at some point? I knew that the conversation was necessary. Obviously, I couldn't have predicted current events, none of us could, but I understood that we reached a wall as we have periodically through the nation's history. The first wall was actually at founding wherein you have this growing awareness or an awareness for the first time that America has a race problem because slavery had been allowed to be built up without, I mean, without a plan in many regards. Certainly in, in Virginia, there was a plan, but it happens piecemeal. And at the time of revolution at the Continental Congress, it was a huge, one of the biggest points of contention was whether or not we're going to allow slavery to be a legal fact in the country. And, and the very forces that we see in Washington now are the forces that were against eradicating slavery at founding. And the question that was put to abolitionists, if we do proceed with, the, uh, with emancipation, the next question is, how do you integrate this population uh, who the people of the country have developed a, by that point, 150 year, generation over generation, bias tool. The answer is we have to integrate them. How do we do it? And that's where that conversation stopped. Okay, that's where it stops, right? We, that's where it stops in the how we do it. So, so people ask how we do it, but they don't really figure out how to do it. Is that they knew how to do it. And right, so observers at the time said, well, we have to, uh, we do in fact have to integrate people. We have to send them to school together at the public expense. We have to bring them into the workforce. We have to bring them into society. And that was, that was too hard a challenge for a country that it united to fight the British and who by that point had, you know, there was a lot, there was a certain amount of racial sentiment in the zeitgeist, if you will. So the people who believed in the eradication of slavery didn't, believe in the integration of black people into American society. You move forward to the Civil War era, 
and Lincoln and Douglas had n numerous conversations about, about the war and what would happen after the war. And Douglas tells him, emancipation is just the beginning. After that, you're gonna have a huge problem of integrating this population into America. And Lincoln says, well, what in fact do black people want? Douglas answers, they want to be a part of America that they have a hand in shaping. Mm, okay, okay. And there are many examples of that that you talk about in your book from there. Um, again, unfortunately, again, I, I wish we had more time to really expound on that. So everybody should read your book. And again, when that happens, you should come back on and everybody should you know, listen to what you're saying. But why don't I you know, just end with the question now specifically you know, I showed you what Brian Stevenson said about everybody needing to go vote. Protesting isn't enough, right? We even seen like an Occupied Wall Street. That was a protest movement. Did that really change anything, right? So, uh, in turn, immediately. So, if, the, if people are saying stop talking uh, and do more action, right? What does that mean? Oh, did I say Amazon too? Uh, Every, go to your local bookstore. Somebody just said that. I, I, I don't like Amazon. I know I, yes, I, I feel bad about that. The tech lash. Uh, so, uh, but it's easier, I guess, in this time. But uh, so, Calvin, uh, what are some uh, suggestions that you feel that all of us as business and creative and artistic and political leaders on this call should really be thinking about? So, and I'll say this, and there are two other moments. The 60s are the last moment. The people in this, we are among the first Americans in this country's history who are not fully shaped by a segregated society. The people in the streets are young people and they are, they, they're infused with the spirit of revolution. They need leadership, to, right? To ask them what the solution is, what the next step is, is not enough. Those at the, at the leadership end of the table have to decide, A, whether or not there's a real commitment to this, and B, whether people are willing to implement a programmatic solution. Right, and so... <laughs> hello, baby. Uh, okay. Well, again, uh, I apologize that we don't have pretty, you know, uh, really deep issue. We should all really be taking seriously, and we are. Um, next week, again, I'm having Cindy Gallup, you know, continuing that conversation as well, as I said. And, uh, you know, Calvin, congratulations. Uh, it's so miraculous that your, you know, book came out right now for us all to read and learn from you. And, uh, you know, again, I want to thank you for being on. And, you uh, uh, I wish you the best, and uh, I hope again that you know everybody gets your book uh, at your local bookstore, uh, even if you have to send a non-tech uh, delivery service to get it, uh, or a non-big tech. <laughs> and uh, you know, thank you. And so this uh, enables us to transition to uh, my favorite part of culture class, which is. Uh, the hearts and minds segment. And uh, here we have Shepard Ferry, who has been a friend for, and we work together too, uh, for many years. Uh, and I'm so honored that you're here. And I think uh, you've been thinking a lot about this. You've been thinking a lot about what's been happening uh, culturally, uh, what's happening, you know, many times before you've created work around race and injustice and police brutality. So it's just coincidental that, you know, we were booking you on this uh, culture class weeks ago. And so uh, I'm so grateful that you're here. So I want everybody to uh, welcome Shepard Ferry. Uh, and uh, thank you for being here. And uh, so Shepard, uh, hi. Hey, how are you? I'm good. So I'm gonna stop share. Um, I'm as good as I can be, um, but I do love that people are joining us here and have continued to build this community. So, you know, I'm a little uh, beclemmed a little bit. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's just uh, jump into like a question that I always ask people for the hearts and minds segment. And I like to connect emotionally. 
And uh, so Shepard, uh, what's in your heart right now? Like, what are you feeling? Uh, you know, it's very, it's very complex. Um, it's very heavy right now for me. Um, because they're, I, I grew up in the South. I grew up around um, some very overt racist attitudes, and then and then some sort of um, almost um, you know subconscious bias from people that didn't have a, a broader perspective. Luckily, I moved first. Uh, I did a year of art high school in California. Then I moved to Rhode Island, which there's racism there too, but. Um, then I moved to California 26 years ago, uh, 25 years ago. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's always been heartbreaking for me to see these examples of racism um, and not enough outrage from the public. So I was extremely happy that George Floyd got a different reaction. Um, but then, um, you know, people hitting the streets and taking a stand, but then of course the, you know, the, the fires and the, and the looting in some ways muddying the message of what's so important, which is that a nation of conscience can't, can't tolerate a police abuse of power and systemic racism. I've made artworks about these things forever because I think one of the main, and I'll one of the main them, actually, I'm going to show a couple. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. You know, one, one of the main <laughs> problems is that um, when there's uh, well, first of all, you, if people didn't know, uh, you know, you were the person who wanted a black president to be uh, leading all of us, and you were right, and you know, that, that's something that kind of goes into the conversation clearly. But these are things that you really wanted me to show to everybody on the on the uh, call right now. And not everyone's going to uh, agree with maybe some of my more provocative images, like the riot cop with the uh, with the flower on the baton that says my florist is a dick. But um, really, the joke there is that um, when people have uh, power that they can abuse, there need to be systems in place <clears throat> to regulate that. And you're you. you a, a florist, it would be very strange if they were sadistic in some way. Someone with unchecked power um, can easily be, uh, you know, willing, it, it, part of a culture of abusing that power. So if there aren't safeguards, that's a real problem. Some of my other images have been about taking people who have been disparaged as, or, or classified as other, as less than what, um, you know, white Americans think is supposed to represent America. And, um, and I've tried to imbue those people with an undeniable um, humanity and, 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 and you could call it patriotism. I make a strong distinction between patriotism and nationalism. Patriotism to me is doing what you can to make your country as ideal as it can be. Nationalism is falling in line with even bad ideas if those ideas are what's being pushed by the powers that be. So, um, you know, I'd say I'm a patriot and I'm a believer in equal humanity. I try to put that in my work. But when I raise money with these works, it goes to places like Black Lives Matter, Equal Justice Initiative, Cut 50, the Southern Poverty, Southern Poverty Law Center, the Amplifier Foundation, um, the ACLU, because I'm lucky that I'm an artist and I can maybe spotlight these, these issues um, and I can vote, which of course is essential to democracy working properly. But um, I also want to make sure that what I'm talking about is not lip service, that I'm, I'm in some way um, very authentically pushing the ideas forward by supporting people that are on the front lines of the the systemic change we need to see. Mm, okay, and so let's uh, talk about you know shifting you know the conversation to you as an artist, right? I mean, when I started working with you and knowing you and collecting your work, you know, I kind of said you're an art activist or a simplification, uh, and 
you know, you do other works. I mean, you do work uh, for brands. You have a commercial studio as well. Uh, you also create works that have nothing to do with global issues, but a, a large uh, a portion of your artwork, and I probably couldn't even count how many pieces of art you produce in the last 20, 30 years. I don't want to age you, but th that also means you've had cultural impact for a really long time. Uh, so, uh, you know, how do you think about you as an artist and your purpose in doing that? Well, I, I look at um, art as one of the really, really amazing realms where you can, um, you can have a therapeutic escape in the process, but you can also have a therapeutic engagement in the result. Not many things work like that. So um, when I feel very frustrated by what's going on in the world, I can um, try to make an image that uh, you know addresses that, and then there's the resolving it aesthetically, which is pure joy for me. Even if I'm struggling, it's it's a joyful struggle. And then I can share my idea and see whether it creates a conversation that I think is constructive and brings people into a conversation they wouldn't have have otherwise. Um, with, with the result and also maybe, you know, like I was saying, raise some money for people that um, are doing good work on these issues. I look at it, I'm, I, I look at it like uh, if, if art is about creating s creative problem solving, if you can solve the visual problem, then you should also want to take on the challenge of solving the conceptual problem and the societal problem. Um, and so, you know, that's where, that's where I'm coming from with it. And could you build on that a little bit more, dig more deeply into that? Sure. Yeah. sure. Um, you know, I, a lot of times people consider visual art as, um, as something that's very much about, um, you know, uh, uh, and uh, some sort of elite dalliance in something frivolous, you know. Um, I actually think that art, visual art can be as essential as um, as as popular music, and so my heroes from popular music are Bikini Kill, uh, Pat, Patti Smith, Bob Marley, Public Enemy, um, The Clash, Rage Against the Machine. Um, you know, a lot of people who have used their art form to make something really enjoyable to listen to, but also have have. Um, use their lyrics as a way to comment on things going on in the world. And, um, and there's a lot of music that I like and a lot of art that I like that isn't social and political, but knowing that that model exists and, and you know, has moved people and can be successful. And I would like to make pictures I'm proud of and statements I'm proud of. Of course, I'm gonna try to follow that model and I'm gonna try to use an accessible language in the work itself so that people feel that they can interpret it and understand it, as well as an, make it accessible, basically. an accessible distribution model of making affordable prints, t-shirts, stickers, murals on the street that are free, uh, paste ups of posters on the street that are free, all the way up to expensive paintings, um, because I love to make paintings I'm proud of. And you know, I think every artist that wants to be a fine artist wants to make a great painting. But, um, but I'm not part of the model from the art world of restrict the supply to increase the demand and make trophies for extremely wealthy people. That's not what I'm doing with my art. There's a version of where wealthy people buy some of your art pieces. So yeah. what do you do in terms of making your art more populist? I mean, you said murals. What are other things that you think about? <laughs> Um, always making affordable prints. I have open edition prints that are 24 by 36 that are signed and they're 35 bucks. Um, I have sticker packs there. You know, you can get a hundred stickers for a few dollars. There's t-shirts that are $25. Um, you know, I follow largely the, the Keith Haring model. Keith Haring did a lot of, um, a lot of social justice imagery, but he also wanted to make sure that he brought a lot of people into the art conversation. He would, he would sell a painting through Tony Shafrazi for several thousand dollars and then and then make prints and go and give them away in, in Central Park. I've also given away a lot of prints um, from, you know, the Obama prints to any uh, number of other things. And um, 
and, and had free downloads of a lot of my imagery so that people can just make their own versions. Um, the We the People images, uh, you know, too many to name. Right. So one of the things that I talked about last class before uh, the George Floyd uh, death and the responses to it was that, again, I said that coronavirus was a magnifier of the problems that we had before, right? I mean, we saw what's happening in our healthcare system. We saw uh, racism and hate, not just in this context, but I said uh, people of Asian descent, not just here in India, um, the upper uh, west, uh, east, west side of India. Uh, you know, we, we've seen what's happening in America in the healthcare system, uh, obviously our political people who are running the country. Um, so, you know, I, the other big issue that you've been talking a lot about is climate change, right? So if this was a magnifier, let's say on um, one thing, you know, racism, and it's accelerated it, right, in terms of our response to it and people really wanting to do something to change this. Uh, do you think the same thing will happen with climate change in terms of a, an issue that has impacted and was on the, uh, the pinnacle of the cultural conversation before COVID? I wish it, it had ever been at the pinnacle of the cultural conversation. It hasn't been. And it's going to be um, devastating if it doesn't become one of the focuses of the conversation. The encouraging thing about the response to COVID is that I've seen a lot of generosity and a lot of um, people making sacrifices for the greater good. One of the biggest problems um, that I've seen um, that is, is uh, a, a sort of myopic selfishness, everything being about me, 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 without thinking empathetically or with compassion for, um, you know, anyone other than yourself. And that, you know, this sense of competition that breeds selfishness, that has been um, suppressed by, whether we like it or not, in some ways by COVID. And the, the ability to um, come to terms with a need for widespread cooperation to um, make sure that we all protect each other with COVID encourages me to think that people can also understand how that's going to need to apply to climate change. Yeah, I'm hoping. Un yeah. Unfortunately, climate change is something that um, is, is happening um, gradually as far as people's attention spans, very rapidly in terms of um, the, the threat it poses, but making un people understand their sense of, of gradual versus the real sense of rapid and, and, and meeting in the middle to know how to solve the problem and, be, you know, and, and have the political will to do so. Um, that's something I'm very, very anxious about. But I make images on a regular basis trying to, um, trying to get people to consider the importance of the issue. And um, yeah, but they're, you know, they're, they're what I've realized, I, I do a, a lot of reading about these things from um, from Naomi Klein to um, to Yuval Noah Harari, um, et cetera. The, you know, the, the, the real thing is that um, a lot of people don't want to make any sacrifice in the short term and, and we will all be pay, paying the price for the way in which they um, and, the, you know, their type in the political structures and the economic structures will will prevent even um, all the people that do have a conscience about the future about how we will be destroying future generations ability to have a good quality of life that uh, you know somehow we need to we need to we need to chip that rust off the off the machine yeah well one of the I just had a conversation again the magnifier accelerator or catalyst you know uh, quote or idea that I've been thinking about is that, you know, part of me thinks that like all these issues that defined our world being on fire before is going to come into a crescendo. And, you know, hopefully this will be uh, a moment in time where we're, you know, healthcare system, uh, inequality, poverty, 
racism, climate change, the protests that are happening all over the world, which are continuing to have, that we really need to figure out how that the only way to solve any of these problems is uh, rebooting uh, humanity. And uh, so I want to encourage everybody to uh, start putting their questions in uh, the chat. One last thing I just want to show a couple, one thing is that Shepard was talking about his We of the People series right here, and I just wanted to make sure you all knew that. Uh, and also uh, Shepard being uh, known for the Obama Hope poster and his Old Bay John campaign, which he started where you just posted everything all around uh, the world so people could like have this, uh, you know, questioning nature of, you know, what this mural was all over the world. And obviously your fans know, but other people didn't. And I always thought that it was just so brilliant that you encourage people to just question and be curious, not just about like, what is this face on this uh, tower over there on a billboard, but like, just do that, like on a more global level. And that always really impacted me when I thought about your work really early on. The other thing, uh, I wanted to say that song that I played twice because of the tech problems, and I apologize, uh, was called From the Menahan Street Band. And it was a, uh, an ode to, uh, even though mo uh, all of them are Caucasian, to uh, the, the, the soul singer, uh, Charles uh, Bradley, who died. And he was supposed to use the, the music to create a new song, and they used it to kind of tribute to him and uh, they also had a uh, uh, black woman, uh, Sandra Williams on the song as well. So in case you wanted, wanted to know why I play that song, uh, that's, that's the reason. So, uh, and I always try to do a song in the beginning of culture class to illuminate the theme. And I do feel that hopefully we have a new day coming and I'm feeling a lot of hope. So uh, let's just jump into questions. Shepard, thank you. Uh, you're always so inspiring. And uh, I'm grateful to know you, and I'm grateful that you're here for the launch of our first class or summer semester. So, uh, okay, does any, I'm looking for a question. If anybody just wants to jump on and uh, I'm looking, I don't know. If somebody could please give us a, how about this, Calvin? What do you have to say about what Shepard has been thinking about? Do you agree or? And I agree, I agree with a great deal of it. And to Shepard, I'd love to continue this conversation offline to the question of what we can do to act and voting at each level is absolutely necessary. But there are also things that we can do in our individual lives, right? We, like, we're part of several institutions as citizens, right? Elect, like citizens of the electorate, citizens in our community, in our, in our places of work, parents who send uh, children to school, ask yourselves how integrated or segregated is the place where my child is going to work, how integrated or segregated are the places where I spend my leisure time and my money. And so this is a field that permeates and shapes us completely, and it is constantly being recreated. The narrative of race isn't inscribed one time. It's inscribed by the very cities that we live in. Right? I live in New York City. Robert Moses did a great deal to right, isolate communities of color to help like, keep the city segregated. And it just, it, it, it affects us every different level. And we have to change each of those levels if we're in fact serious. And on a corporate level, what would you say for us to, like what should be some of the things that we talk about with our teams and our employers and our clients and our customers and our consumers? So I'm gonna say this, none of us are empty vessels waiting to be filled. There are, if we're serious about moving an organization from one state to the next, that's a whole program of change management. But right, the, the broad strokes are hiring, mentoring, promoting, right? That's the, like, those are the three easy yeah. steps. In terms of how we feel interpersonally, that goes so deep and we can all go to group therapy together. I prefer to focus on tangible outcome. That's the way we achieve something real. Okay, and Shepard, do you have a question for Calvin before he goes? Is that okay, Calvin? Sure. 
Well, I, I you know, I asked um, and uh, about in the, you know, in, in the, with the momentum of what's going on with the protests and these issues being top of mind, you know, what meaningful steps could people make, you know, other than voting, which is of course really essential. But um, I mean, that, that idea of how we spend our money, a lot of people don't think about the political power there that um, that when, when you hurt people's pocketbook and you, you know, and you patronize places, you're, you know, you're setting an example and you're, you're sending, you're sending a message. So um, yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up, but really, I just want to, I want to hear more from you on, um, you know, what you think, it's such a big problem and a lot of people feel powerless. What you think are, are personal steps, you know, even you know, beyond that or, or in more detail on that? Personal steps, can I ask you more specific? Like how do we connect the energy of the protests to the rest of our lifetimes? Yeah, yeah. Because that is in fact what it's going to take. And it is beyond that, it is a generation over generation problem. So, right, like the, the things that we do immediately, obviously donate, write to your Congress people, right? Those are like, the, that's, the, that's the top of the line, but then it starts to get really subtle and it becomes complete. And so I say, we have to act locally. We have to act in our communities, in our homes and in the polling place. Voting seems to be the through line to all of this. Well, it's, but not just voting, because we don't, there are things we can do without Washington. That was one of the amazing things Brother Stevenson pointed out in the article. There are solutions, right? Commissions have been paneled since the civil rights movement. We can go back. There's, real, there's very little new that we can say about this. You can go back. You can re read what King said, read what X said, read what Baldwin said. And we've come to the state where we are repeating. It's a derivative state. Every area of society has impaneled a commission to, right, be it education, be it uh, each specific industry, to ask ourselves, what can we do better? And every time this happens, we, we, like, we feign naivete. We have to stop feigning naivete. <laughs> point uh but i encourage everybody to put more questions but calvin you need to uh leave thanks jump thank you this has been a pleasure i hope we do it again one last thing calvin could i email you for maybe a book list at this community because as your teacher i'd love to come up with a curriculum for everybody absolutely we can make your it book will be on the top of the list right? i'll break it down okay right. break Enjoy. it down for me and i'll email everybody that as well who's on this call and a link to calvin's book Thank you, Calvin. Good thank you, Brad. Thank yeah, you, Shepard. Thank you for writing it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, last question. Let's say many of us aren't artists, right? I mean, artists in the way that you're doing. I think we're all artists, whether even if you're uh, somebody who just looks at numbers all day. Everybody needs an artistic, creative, curious mind to succeed today and a desire to learn. Is there one takeaway just from your experience with life that everybody who's from all different industries on this call, and again, I'm so grateful that all of you are here, uh, any type of advice, life lesson that we could all take away after this talking to you? Well, I, I think that we all have um, creativity in us. And even if it, mani if it manifests in a, you know, a strong articulation of, of an, of an idea. And, and then of course, if you can articulate an idea, well, then you have to have the courage to, to convey it. But also I think being creative in, um, in what you take in as well, expanding your horizons, different perspectives, the amount of creativity that is inspired for me by being a constant, um, you know, sponge is, uh, you know, that's, that's really, really crucial. And um, I mean, we all have um, sometimes patterns and habits, but, but trying to keep your eyes and your mind open, um, that is a creative process and anybody can, can be creative in that way. Yeah, it's about learning. And that's yeah. the point of- Hey, yeah, they wouldn't here. be here if it weren't for you, man. Oh, dude, I love you too. I mean, let's all come together and uh, help make the world good. Again. For sure. 
Um, so again, thank you, Shepard, for coming here. Everybody, obviously, we've had an amazing turnout. I appreciate uh, uh, everybody being here. Shepard, Calvin, who you're not on the phone anymore or online anymore, thank you. And I just wanted to say, uh, again, please come. We have nine more classes in the summer semester. And uh, it's going to be the same day, same time. Next week, we have every week, we'll have a different expert from a different theme. Next week, we have Cindy Gallup, the cultural revolutionary. Uh, then we have Kate Byer, who is a psychiatrist and a psychopharmacologist to talk about mood and how mental illness is on the rise and what we could do about it. And then we'll go a little corporate. If anybody wants to know about real estate, we're gonna have somebody talk about the future of the real estate market and the context of everything. It is contextualized through creativity. Last week or two weeks ago, many of you saw the Highline architect, Charles Renfro of Diller Scafidio Renfro. And one of his utopian feelings is that because people are leaving New York and other cities, this is gonna be an amazing time for artists to come back in. Uh, and it could be more uh, multifaceted and have more diversity and inclusion, uh, you know, more low income housing and artists could come. So like, I believe that we're gonna have a cultural renaissance and all of you who are creative and artistic and entrepreneurs, this is a great time for all of us to really use our skills to change the world. So, uh, Thank you all for coming. I hope to see you next week. Uh, and then after Mike Lubin, who's the real estate guy, we're gonna talk about who's gonna be here. Like I said, there's nine more classes for summer semester. Thank you, Shepard. Thank you, everybody. Uh, love you all. Thanks. And uh, thanks for being here for the 12th week of culture class. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.